Yeah, so coming coming south from the end of Drybrook Road, the Drybrook Trail, so the blue trail that you know eventually leads to the little side spur trail that goes up towards uh, Balsam Lake Mountain, that was an old road, and it was essentially an ox path. Oh wow! Uh, and there was an attempt to turn it into a jeep road, and it was just it was unsuccessful. Um, you know, you see where the first half, the northern half, it had been improved to allow access to the fire tower. But having it, you know, a thoroughfare that connected all the way through to the south to, to, to Beaver Kill Road, it was just never viable. It, it would wash out too much. It was too steep. It was too eroded. Mm. Jeeps would get stuck. So, you know, as an octopath, totally worked. You know? <laughs> crazy. It's crazy <laughs> stuff to think about. Like, like it, it's so great. This is why I do this. Is, you know, the education coming to the people. They're just probably going to be like, holy crap, I never really thought of that. The bushwhacks were some of uh, the worst days I've ever had in the mountains, or life, really. But I also, I think I wore khakis because they had a lot of pockets. I think so. Why the Catskills is such a great place for trout. It was really the development of New York State. Catskills were responsible. Now you're listening to Inside the Line, the cat skills. All right, well, so Will, so a big question I, I have, and I want your opinion because I've I've thought I've thought about this, and I've heard other people's opinion about this. Uh, when you're attacked by by bears, what is the best tactic to do besides you know being like angry and show them that you're bigger? What what do you think is another good way? Oof. I, I mean, I can give you many examples of like personal examples of coming across bears. You know, I won out in Alder Lake, which is not too uh, far from the area that we're going to talk about later on, where bear came into camp. I was like the first one up and you know, I'm making coffee. So I took the food down out of the tree. One of the other guides woke up. She's doing some yoga. And this is like the, the third day, you know, it's, uh, the fourth morning of the trip. And, uh, you know, just we'd kind of settle down and we were making so much noise. The kids who were all in the group were all still sleeping. And this bear just comes down and I kind of see it out of the corner of my eye. And I'm trying to get the other guy's attention and, and you know, not startle the bear. But, like, I'm also, like, looking like, all right, he's closer to the food than I am. I'm not going to go and grab the food. So, you know, once the bear saw me looking over you know, at the other person, the bear just kind of just bolted, grabbed the handle of the cooler and food bag and just started running up the hill. Uh, luckily, you know, it caught on a uh, on a down tree, down log, and kind of tore it out of its mouth. And the bear kind of kept going and turned back. By then, the two of us had kind of grouped closer together, so the bear was kind of like hesitant, like, uh, "There's two of them. There's food. There's two of them. So we yeah. go to make noise. And who wakes up? Not the other two adults. Not not the you know not the two adults who were you know customers, but the youngest kid, four years old." And he sees the food, he sees the bear, he grabs an axe, and he yells at the bear, go back to the zoo, that's my food. No <laughs> so way, course, awesome. It's, of course, I'm laughing, because I'm like, did this kid just tell his bear to go back to the zoo? I look over, my other, my other colleagues, she's just down on her knees laughing, and the bear's just kind of like, all right. He makes another break for it, goes, grabs the cooler again, runs up the hill, hits a stump, cooler tumbles back down the hill. At this point... You know, one of the adults finally wakes up, comes out. We start banging pots and pans, and you know the bear was just like, "All right, that's that's enough. I'm out of there." So you know, in some cases that works, making making your making a lot of racket. There, you know, if a bear, if they're, if they're just testing the waters, you know, from from becoming a wild bear into becoming a habituated bear, you can still kind of scare them. But I had another incident when I was out in Canada, out in Vancouver. Uh, these bears are just well trained. You know, there's designated hiking spot or camping spots. You can't camp, you know, uh, at will. You can't camp, you know, anywhere other than. So they they just learn the spots. And you know, if if a spot kind of develops a reputation, the bear knows that too. Oh yeah. So we had this uh, halfway through this trail up there. There's a ferry crossing, and you know we're hanging out with the. Uh, with the guys who are on the ferry crossing, uh, at the ferry crossing, there's a there's a crab pot and three fishing poles. You can get a salmon dinner for twenty bucks, or or a lobster, you know, or a crab dinner for for twenty bucks. So, 
had two crab dinners, had a couple of beers, and uh, it was 4.10. Local crab fisherman shows up. He's like, ah, 10 more minutes. I was like, 10 more minutes till what? Till you go home? 10 more minutes till the end of your shift? And, oh, we're in Vancouver. It's 4.10. That's what 10 more minutes is. (laughs) So, you know, we celebrated. And just as we're getting ready to pack our stuff, because the last boat goes over at 4.30, they're like, hey, there's a bear on your side of the river. Mm. You know, and I can see my buddy at this time. It doesn't doesn't normally celebrate as much as I do. Kind of like I can see him kind of just doing one of these. He's like trying to get the words out. You can see him like he's just like and finally he spits it out. He goes, how, "How do you know there's a bear on our side of the river?" And without missing a beat, the fisherman looks over at this grizzled old black lab and he goes, "Rambo only barks at bears." <laughs> like, oh, all right. So sure enough, they take us over there after taking us out a little bit. You know, out of the. Uh, because it's an in-water, uh, uh, inland saltwater lake. So they take us out in the Pacific a little bit. You know, it was kind of rough, so they didn't take us out too far. And then they drop us off, and sure enough, a big steaming pile of bear shit. So we're like, all right, that's a big bear, because that's a big pile of shit. So for the next three days, the bear was just just following behind us, just kind of stalking us and seeing like, all right, you know, can I get an opportunity for this group to kind of separate and make themselves smaller so I can pick one of them off? And finally, on the third day, you know, we get to camp early. We're like, you know, what? we're tired, tired of keeping watch every night, tired of like, you know, doing all this. So, we, you know, we figured five mile day. Let's get to the beach with daylight, just, you know, have have supper early, get our stuff in the woods before it's dark you know, put it in the lockbox and, and whatnot. And, you know, we're just sitting down. A couple of the guys from from uh, one of the villages came over, you know, celebrated some more with us. And, uh, you know, sure enough, I'm like, you know, at this point, I'm I'm tired. I'm stoned and I'm in tourist mode. I was like, oh, look, wildlife. And they just get up and start running towards the bear. Uh-huh. And so, you know, they go, and we're like, oh, safety in numbers. We should probably go with them. So we ran all the way down the beach. There's a little, you know, kind of inlet where some water was coming out. And they're like, you guys stay on this side. We'll go over there. We'll yell if we need you. You know, so they chased the bear off. And, you know, sure enough, bear came back later, later that night. So we wound up grouping all the campers together. And, uh, you know, just making ourselves one big group. So, you know, the larger you are as a group, you know, the more the bear is going to kind of like be hesitant, like, all right, if I could be outnumbered, if I could be surrounded, then, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of, you know, play this easy. And I'll just, just, so what it did is, you know, we all took turns staying awake and it, it was dark. You really couldn't see much. You know, it was, there was dense cloud cover, you know, no moon. So you couldn't see much more than your headlamp, you know? So if you caught some eye shine, that, that was about all you got. Mm-hmm. So once, once sun came up, you know, I went out and looked at the tracks, the birds circled around us getting closer and closer. And just, you know, we had a big fire. And that was that the bear was like, yeah, yeah, there's nothing good here. Cause we'd all locked up our food. So it was like, yeah, too many of them. It smells too yeah. much like people. And I'm guessing and that, that was pres- presuming that was in Vancouver. You had a grizzly bear. Uh, so we were Southern Vancouver, so it was still a black bear, but oh, she okay. was a, probably about a 550 pound sow. So for Ooh, a female wow. to be that large, she was a well-fed, you know, both natural, you know, she scooping up salmon left and right. And also just, you know, raiding campers, you know, backpacks and wow. you know, get tons, tons of good dehydrated food, <laughs> you yeah. know, whatever else. So it was a well-fed bear and definitely, you know, she, she was on the line of not being timid. She was, you know not afraid to to stick with us and and, and kind of like just wait for that opportunity and luckily you know we never gave her that opportunity to, to move any closer I mean, still 15 feet is, is pretty close and she made a couple yeah. circles around us so it's like all right cool yeah maybe we leave the slow canadian hikers behind <laughs> right right <laughs> yeah. the stoner I mean, canadian. I, had a, I had another incident in the catskills where you know this is this is a, an example of a good unhabituated just natural you know wild bear i was I was hiking up Platte Clove, you know, one August, and, you know, I mean, if you've ever been up there from the bottom, it's very narrow, so you got, you know, an increasingly higher, you know, cliff on one side, and then a bigger and bigger drop down to the to the water on the other side, so I'm, I'm to the point where it's probably about 60, 70 feet down to the water, and it's just starting to really cliff out to, to my right as I'm heading up, and I come around a bend in the trail, and who's coming the other way? Big old no black way. Bear. <laughs> and you know, I kind of did one of those things. I looked at him. Then we both looked up the hill. And we're like, that's steep. And then we both looked down. I'm like, that's far. And there's rocks down there. And then I kind of did one of those. Where I corner him. And I'm like, 
ah, shit, this is where I get eaten. I'm hiking alone. No one's even going to find my body. <laughs> and just as I'm thinking, like, all right, this is it. This is it. The bear lets out this grunt, just lays down. I was like, oh, shit, I didn't think about that option. You stay here, and I'll go back that way. <laughs> <laughs> no way. So, you know, quietly just kind of backed up. And once I was out of sight, I just took off running. The bear was just like, you know what? I just want to get down to the water. <laughs> yeah, right? Crazy. I didn't want to do anything with, you know, it didn't want anything to do with me. I didn't think about it. It's August. It's, it's you know, it's a bear. It's hot as shit. All it wants yeah. to do is get in the water. Yeah, so, yeah. So, yeah. like, um, I've always wondered, you know, when if you're up like caught in the in the high dense areas, if you know they say never, you know, never run away from a bear. But you got to admit, up in those high dense areas, those bears ain't gonna do anything in between those trees. They're just gonna get hit and stuck and stuff like that. And you can kind of outrun it, but you can't. I don't know if you can you can probably outsmart it too, but it's just it's just gonna find you. Their smell is, is insane. So their sense of smell is good. It all so it really depends on where the wind's going. If the wind is at the bear's back and it's blowing your scent away, once you're about eight to ten feet away, it can't see you. You think about a bear and the way it it's scavenging for food. It's looking close down. It's flipping rocks over. It's scratching at the ground or logs or stuff like that. It's eyesight. It's very nearsighted. So once you get a certain distance away, they're not gonna really be able to see you. Yeah. But if the wind's blowing at your back, it, they're going to be able to pick you out like that. Wow. So you know, it's it's one of those things where you got to you got to you know have the presence of mind to know what the advantage is. Yeah. Um, so real quick, going back to the the story in Vancouver, when those when the two guys who lived in the local village, um, you know, ran over and they crossed a little stream at a inlet. Uh, one guy threw a rock and it hit the bear in the head. Well, he was kind of just behind. Uh, and you know downwind of the of the bear so just behind this little shrub he hid there the bear saw the other guy because he was so close bluff charged him whoa and luckily it was only a bluff charge because they i mean they were they were within feet of each other um but yeah as soon as soon as the other guy was you know i mean he was out of sight so uh, you know as far as the bear knew the other guy didn't exist yeah. So, uh, and it was, wow. it was pretty wild to see that. And I was like, oh, that guy's going to get, oh, cool. That's a bluff charge. Okay. That's what it looks like in real life. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's crazy, man. I just, I, I mean, being him, you know, he probably had, had the adrenaline rush. But when you're standing outside of that, you know, you're, you're a bystander and that stuff, you're just like, yeah, uh, what, what do we do? Like, uh, is this like, do we let him handle it or what is the bear going to handle it? Like, that's really, that's a really tough situation. Yeah, it was one of those where it was like, all right, knives ready, get the first aid kit. Oh, he's got, oh, he did. Oh, okay. Oh, no, I, I like that option. Okay. Uh, just, just a bluff charge. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. I've always, I've always wondered what the, what the best tactic, especially up, you know, in the high dense areas, like, you know, you're at the top in the balsams and stuff like that. If, if you, I mean, eventually you're going to run out of room and hit a ledge or something like that. Oh, so that's yeah. the crappy thing. You're going to get stuck. Uh, you know, you'll hit a dead end. You'll, you know, you'll get, you'll get caught in that, you know, I mean, that's, that's like snag brush. It just, it just grabs you. You know, you hit an yeah. area where you get a couple deadfall in there or some dense stuff. You, you're not making progress, but the good thing is the bear isn't either. You know, so, I mean, if you're, if you're aware of it and you know you got the wind at your back since blowing your scent towards the bear it's like okay all right this isn't good like i'm not invisible it's gonna know that i'm here and it's gonna it's gonna be persistent it's gonna it's gonna continue to try and push me out of its territory but if the flip side's there and then the wind's at the bear's back all you got to do is be quiet not you know not alert you know its sense of hearing you know just kind of like lay low let it play out and let the bear kind of do its thing yeah. Yeah. There's so I've I've run into a black bear twice in the Catskills. Yeah. One, um, it was off on a waterfall and it saw me and it sprinted out of the way. Or well, actually yeah. three times, sorry. First time I ran into a black bear was my first hike ever in the Catskills. My first first solo hike in the Catskills. Whoa. And uh it was up on Balsam Mountain and you know, I, I saw a cub peeking over a little log and like kind of like rubbing its back. Yeah. And then at, at that second I was just like, Oh shit. The mama's somewhere. somewhere. So <laughs> yeah. I was just like, I'm out. I just started flying out of there. I was just like, no way. And I took one little picture and I got like a picture of him peeking over the the log. Um, nice. The third time we were up on Graham Mountain. Uh, this was a while back, of course, when it was actually an, um, an area you could hike in. And we found a cub like 30 feet in one of the trees. 
Oh, wow. And it was four of us. So we were at our distance, but we were like taking pictures here and there. And we yeah. had a dog with us. So we were like, bring the dog like 50 feet over that way. Don't let it see it. Or it's going to like. Yeah. But but then we're all like, somebody's got to keep watch to see if the mom's here. The mom didn't come out at all. It was just the cub sitting up there looking down at us. Yeah. Um, and then there were two times up in um, the Canadian Rockies when I was up in Banff National Park and stuff like that. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. We hiked a, a 9,500 foot mountain and on our way down, there was a bear eating some grub and stuff like that on the side of the mountain. And you could hear those, those huffs, those like oh, that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, my wife didn't notice it. And I grabbed her backpack and I was just like, you know, you've heard of the crazy, <laughs> yeah, you've heard right of the, there. yeah, you've heard of the crazy stories of, of grizzly bears. They don't, they don't mess. Uh, they don't want to mess around. They want to eat you and they want food. Oh yeah. Um, no, they'll, they'll, They'll go straight to tearing you open and getting the, getting the choice bits out of you. Yeah. Yeah. So I told her, I'm just like, we got to back up. And uh, like, she had a panic attack. She started running up the trail, running up the trail, at least not down the trail towards yeah, it. Yeah. And uh, when I said something, I was like, Hey, like that. And he, like, I didn't yell it that loud, but uh, she, she kept going. And then the bear saw me and then like, kind of like turned around, but fell. And then it fell oh. down kind of like a ravine, like 20, 30 feet. I was like, no, oh, no. <laughs> oh, I man. felt so bad. Yeah. But other than that, like not, nothing big. I was just curious of what people think of that. You know, um, if, yeah, if- the, 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 you know the, the, the advice I've gotten over the years, you know, the biggest, biggest advice, and this bears out in statistics, is bears generally don't attack, rarely attack groups larger than three and very rarely attack a group a uh, five or larger. Um, it just at that point, they're they they're thinking to them, so they're doing the math and they're like, "That's a lot of calories. I'm going to burn. I'm going to be outnumbered. I can be <laughs> surrounded. It's not worth the effort." Now yeah. there are there are you know exceptions to that rule when you're in a group of five and everyone sprints in opposite directions. All of a sudden, you've made yourself you know five individuals. Yeah, and whoever is downwind you know or or upwind of the bear and, and you know easily tracked is getting nibbled on yeah so so if you're alone basically make yourself look big and tell them not, not to, to mess with you or if you're with people make yourself look even bigger <laughs> yep stay together I mean, that, and just yeah the probability of a black bear attack here in in the northeast is very 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 rare they've got to be rare. Uh, you know it's it's in areas uh so there was the one in northern new jersey a couple years back but effectively that was a group that was, you know, they split up after after encountering the bear. Uh, the bear had been very habituated. Um, you know, yeah. the bear was also, you know, had had two previous run-ins with people, so it was already on edge. So, you know, you, you setting the stage for that bear just to be anxious, right? Yeah. Yep. You know, and then they went and took pictures of the bear and kind of, te- you know, essentially taunted the bear even more, got it even more riled up, and then when they freaked out they split in five different directions, you know, leaving the wow. one guy, unfortunately, to, to, to get chomped on. Wow. Uh, but, yeah, the, the, the odds of a bear attack, they're exceedingly rare. They're historically, you know, it, it's been primarily a thing that would happen with hunters uh, or trappers, and that's, that's people going out as an individual uh, or separating from their group. Uh, being alone, and a lot of times they had things like bait with them to lure the bear in, whether they mm. were burning syrup or something like that. You know, things they used to do back in, back in the old days. I mean, it really hasn't happened, you know, in recent time, uh, and it is exceedingly rare. I do, I do wonder with the increase of people and campsites becoming more messy and, and bears becoming more hit, habituated, if the possibility is, you know, increasing. Then yeah, might, yeah. But it hasn't happened yet, so you know. Hopefully, you know, we as a as an outdoor recreation community are are able to spread the word faster and teach our our you know our new counterparts and colleagues you know some some good etiquette out there to kind of you know keep those behaviors on the bear side uh, from 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 growing and developing. And you know, bears are incredibly intelligent, and they'll in times of plenty. They'll instead of competing with each other, they'll share knowledge with each other and team up. Mm. Uh, they'll also have larger litters, so that knowledge can get spread further and faster. Um, so it's it's one of those things where it's like if we keep giving them food and 
you know, keep renting out these Airbnbs and leaving garbage out and unsecured. It's like they're going to start to learn these habits and they're going to yeah. eventually start to learn that, that we're more afraid of them <laughs> than they are of us. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's ho- hopefully that's that's not what happens. But, you know, it, it's kind of leaning towards things could, you know, could yeah, increase could. the odds of that a bad encounter. Yeah, yeah. Well, good. Thanks. Thanks for the advice. And thanks for the uh the uh experiences too that's that's awesome stuff that's crazy stuff so um yeah all right so welcome to episode good intro welcome to episode 54 of inside the line the cat skills i have my friend will soder here um he is a guide in the cat skills uh and he has a lot of knowledge of the willow Wemek and the beaver kill valley and that's what we're going to talk about tonight the willow Wemek and the beaver kill valley is a very secluded valley in the cat skills very remote and it has a lot of history and mostly Native American history and fly fishing history. And I've always wondered about that. And a lot of people probably wonder about that because they're not really familiar with the Willow Mimic and the Bigger Co Valley. They're more familiar, you know, with Sullivan County and Green County. So I have Will here to talk about that as I want to always to know about the Native American history because there's very little of it and about it and written in the Catskills unless you dig deep and Will knows that stuff and he has dug deep. So we're going to talk about that tonight. So welcome to the show, Will. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. And it really is that that part of our history is something that's still being, you know, kind of ironed out as, uh, you know, different groups come to the, come to the forefront and are being more involved in the uh, conversations of different, different, uh, you know, groups of indigenous people are, are now being kind of incorporated back into the conversation about what that is. So we're getting an increasingly better uh, and more accurate picture uh, of, of what's going on. Uh, it's really interesting, too, because it's it's layers. You know, we think of these, a lot of people think of that area uh, and they think of them as the Delaware Indians. Mm-hmm. Um and you know you're like who are the delaware indians i are you know i've heard of the lenape and i've I've, you know heard of the mohicans and the mahicans and 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 the algonquins and the iroquois who are these people and well delaware are the lenape lenape which are algonquin indians so they they're you know a a family uh within the algonquin uh indian tribes or 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 family of tribes uh and they were called delaware indians because essentially they lived on the land it was their land uh that was taken over or essentially acquired by lord delaware so they're like who are these people oh those those are the delaware indians um and it had been you know a thing that really became such a such a part of the nomenclature you just knew that you know this was the region that the delawares had Uh um you know and now as we start to kind of go back and 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 really kind of look at history with both perspectives, we're starting to go, okay, well, at this point, this group was here. And at this point, this group was here. And these different families or different clans within the group had different time periods where they were in in different areas. So it, it's neat and it's ever evolving. Uh, and, and I'm glad to see a lot of involvement with uh, a lot of the different uh, Lenape tribes and, and, and families and clans uh, being able to step back to the table and share their their story. When you look at the uh, the history that's recorded so each um, <clears throat> unit management plan, so each each wild forest or, or wilderness area has its own unit management plan. And part of that is the history. So when you look mm. at that, um, it's it's kind of vague, you know, and it's so this is this is, you know, that's the best when that was written back in the 90s. That was the best information they had then. Um, so compare that to now where you've got a lot of people stepping to the table and we're getting a little bit, you know, we're kind of filling in the gaps and it's not quite yeah. as vague. We're starting to get more of a timeline of when this group or when this family was here and, and how those boundaries kind of shifted uh, back then and, you know, who yeah. had control uh, o- over the lands. And, uh, you know, that interest, that area in particular was, you know, kind of a dividing line. Uh, it was a natural barrier uh, because of the rivers um, that kind of, you know, the Iroquois and the Algonquins uh, at, at different times used it kind of as a boundary. They also used it as a, as a area to so went a little further North there to the Papacton Valley, uh, which is the East branch of the Delaware and now the Papacton Reservoir. And mm-hmm. that was a place where they'd come together. They'd have, they'd have meetings to either hash stuff out like, Hey, we got a, you know, we got something going on. We got to figure out, otherwise we're going to fight over it or in times of abundance to, to trade. Um, so there's a lot of history there and, and a lot of push and pull uh, with, with who kind of controlled 
what and what side of what and had access to to you know what resources but yeah, by so and large we'll that de- we'll definitely talk about that tonight don't go too far into everything yet all right it's it's awesome stuff i'm, I'm sitting at the edge of my seat oh, yeah. trust it's, me. It, it's 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 layers and layers of stuff too and that's what's good so excellent yeah glad to have you here tonight will so I'd like to thank the monthly supporters, uh, Darren White, Vicky Ferreira, John Comiskey, Alec Betancourt, Sarah Bacon, Jim Carraba, Michael Bongner, and David Mead, and Matt Smith. Thank you. Um, if you don't know what a monthly supporter is, they support the show monthly. They donate a certain amount monthly to keep my show going, basically, to help. It gives me a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of support, and I I, I thank you guys very greatly for, for doing that. And... Uh, Hopefully you're still enjoying the show after 54 episodes. <laughs> Jeez, they must be because they're still donating. <laughs> um, so, Will, we talked about this uh, through text messages and stuff like that. What are we drinking tonight? What are you having? Ah, so I've got a nice bottle of tequila here, a little Class A Azul. Fancy. Uh, yeah, it's super fancy. Not something I'd run out the liquor store and pony up the money for, but... I've got a couple of great clients, and uh, one of them knows that I happen to to like this. He brought it on a trip one time. I said, "What is that?" He goes, "Oh, I, I'll get you a bottle of it." So every time I go out with him, he'll he'll bring me a bottle, and it's just it's a real fancy and a uh, kind of pricey, but good sipping tequila. It's it's straight up, no nothing, just the straight up tequila. Just tequila and a big ice cube in there. Crazy, crazy! I yeah. can't I can't drink liquor like that. That's that that kills me. It's, it's super smooth and. The bottle's nice. My favorite part is the lid is a bell. Oh, wow. (laughs) Wicked. That is so cool. Now, now is that like a, a, an indigenous thing? Like a, or is that just a, some guy that random guy that likes that? Is that. So it it is a big liquor company that went, that went down there uh, and developed this, but these, each one of these bottles is handmade down in Mexico. So. Wow. Yeah money does go back to the community that that uh, actually produces this which is pretty cool and you, each bottle is different each bell is a little bit different so if you get a couple of them you can kind of ding them all and play a tune <laughs> nice nice that's wicked yeah. Yeah. yeah so i'm i'm having tequila as well hornitos uh, that uh did a shot of hornitos a shot of triple sec and then i have some local tea here from from Delhi, uh, Tay Tea, which is a watermelon tea, and they're from Delhi, and she makes it from Delhi. So I'll I'll tag her nice. in this as well, just to to get some local shout outs to some local people. I love doing local stuff. Absolutely. Um, so some news I got. Uh, do you remember the vandalism at the John Rob Lead Two that happened a year ago? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> do it's I been- ever remember that? It's been a year, and uh, yeah. you know that was that was an insane time. Number one, because the guy is a freaking moron. Uh, yeah. Number two, we haven't heard. I haven't heard anything about if he's been charged or not, or what the the penalties were. Have yeah, you? I haven't heard anything either. Yeah, that was a, that was a great time, man. I remember. You know, the funny thing is, is I interviewed the guy. Um, I don't know if you're on you're on Instagram a lot, but it's called the ADK Fun Police. Have you ever heard of them? Yeah, yeah, I have. Yeah. Yeah. He uh was the one that, that like kind of didn't turn him in but follow like was following him and he f- saw him going up there from Hunter, you know, driving his freaking truck up one of the ski runs and live doing it live. So he called the Rangers and he's the one that, you know, like like kind of got him caught. Yeah. So, and I was just like it's been a year because I remember seeing it on my um my my Instagram or my um facebook memories and i was just like i remember contacting one of the rangers and seeing you know what's what's going on what's what's the charges and stuff and they said something due to covid they they had to cancel it so i don't know i'm gonna have to dig deep and see what's going on with that Uh, hmm. yeah so that's pretty cool over over a year and then they they redid the whole whole lean too so um that stupid crap that he did that was on there that he didn't think was was bad to do so uh, yeah, I mean that was that was the best part is he totally was a moron. He like he, he put it out to the world. Here's who I am. Here's what I just did. I, yeah. I'm still here right now. <laughs> yep. And then he tagged. He put his at. You know yeah. his, his his tag. I'm just like that's got to be the dumbest thing. Yeah. Ugh, God, people are so dumb. And then he goes back up there doing it live with, I forget what it was a power sander or something like that. Yeah. And 
I was just like, wow, this guy, this guy is extra stupid, but <laughs> we'll, we'll see. I'll have to look into that and get that, that down of what, what the charges were and stuff. So also volunteer, volunteer anywhere. Um, I, like I said, uh, last episode, the summer season has come to an end and yeah. you know, not many volunteers, but we still have roadside cleanups. We still have some at least churl building stuff like that um you can volunteer anywhere local uh your local areas or stuff like that uh, i suggest anything so yeah there's 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 a lot of great opportunities that have re- and the trail conference has really brought in a lot of new young people even since i was was you know managing things with the trail conference it's it's gotten so much more robust on the administrative side and they've really started to develop local crews they've i've seen trail you know some of the trail building crews out there redoing you know, infrastructure like bridges uh they just did the bridge out in uh devil's kitchen uh yep. there was one up in uh, uh 23 coming in towards uh window that, that washed oh, out yeah. so it's it's nice to see that you know there's some actual motion coming when i was managing the conservation corps there was it was inconsistent and, and there was a lot of difference between the trail conference and the uh, state. So it was hard to kind of get traction going. Uh, mm. and we were, we we're getting a lot of volunteers more frustrated than we were getting work out of them. Yep. Uh, but things have really kind of like coalesced into a nice position now. And it's nice to see there are a lot of robust, there's more opportunities than there are volunteers. You're right there. So, uh, yeah. but there's, there's definitely a lot of good opportunities and well-managed now, which is, which is nice. If you're going to give up your time and put your effort into something you love, it's nice to have it run smoothly. And it's, uh, you got some good people out there running, running these crews and managing the opportunities. Hell yes. So good. Thank you. That's awesome. I'm glad somebody else agrees with me as well, that things are going pretty smooth and that we're going in the right motion. Let's just say that we're doing, we're going the right way. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're getting things repaired that that should have been repaired, you know, a while ago. And uh, like I said, some good people out there managing the, uh, the process now and, and some good, finally some good uh, streamlined thought process on it as well, which is, which is nice to see. Hell yeah. You know, it's, uh, I'll add this, you know, uh, even though we had a lot of like, you know, kind of stop and start push and pull when I was involved, we had a lot of fun projects, you know, I had some, some fun projects doing the bog bridge up on Cornell. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> even though we had to carry all the lumber in, they wouldn't let us use the helicopter because the ground crew wasn't trained. Yeah. So we had to carry all that up and over slide and then down Jesus. and then up Cornell. And, you know, the, the best part was it took months to get all the stuff up there. And it took about 15 minutes to, to screw everything together. It was like, <laughs> it's kind of anticlimactic. I mean, like, can we take it apart and do it again? <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Like all that right, effort was, on the way up, and then you get the way you get there, and you're just like, "All right, we're we're done now. What? We're, we're done. Mm-hmm. That's it." <laughs> but you, you meet a lot of cool people, and you have a lot of cool experiences, and um, you know, I, I've had trail crews out there uh, in different places, and it's just it's fun to you spend that time bonding. You work hard during the day, you sit around the fire at night, and it's a lot of fun. You know, and even on the shorter ones where you're just out there for a portion of the day. You know, it's a different type of experience in the woods. You get to see the scenery, you get to do the hike, but you also get to chat with people. You're doing the work, you're seeing the improvement. And a lot of times it's stuff you walk past and you're like, man, this is really annoying me. (laughs) Yeah. And then you finally get an opportunity to make the difference. You're like, God, that does look so much better. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Right. And then, you know, like people give you a compliment. I mean, we have social media these days and they, you you see a compliment uh, on there about with one area and you're just like, man, I, I freaking did that. Yeah, like that was awesome. Me and a bunch of guys, a bunch of other people did that. Like, yeah, it's a great feeling. So excellent. Uh, Once again, thank you for anyone who volunteers or anybody who is going to volunteer. Please do it. It's worth it. Trust me. All right. So usually I I will. I do a a Catskill Mountain history part, but uh, we're going to be talking about history tonight. So I'm not going to do that. Usually I have uh, Huey Lewis in the news. I don't know if you've ever heard listened to any of my podcasts, but it breaks into uh, Going Back in Time by Huey Lewis. But we're going to put both of those together, and we're going to start talking about history tonight. So I'd like to welcome the guest of the night, Will Soder, and we're going to talk about the Beaver Kill and the Little Weemick Valley. Let's go! If you're not familiar with this area, it is the western part of the Catskills. It doesn't it has very few high peaks, very few high peaks, but it has the best fishing rivers in the Catskills, the best fishing rivers considered probably in the world. 
potentially. Mm-hmm. And I would, yeah, right. It's the birthplace of American fly fishing. Yeah. That, so yeah. it's, it, you know, it's, yeah, you got fly fishermen who go out to Montana, Idaho, you know, places like that, and they love it. They have fun. But to come here and get a native brook trout, it's like it's a peak experience for most fly fishermen. Uh, and especially, you know, you, you can go lower down on the Delaware or lower down on the Beaver Kill. You know, you can go on the Esopus. But to get to these headwaters and fish the Willow Weemock and fish the Beaver Kill is just such a prized experience mm-hmm. um, that, you know, a lot of people do it. And, and to this day, there's a lot of private land that holds and guards fishing access on big stretches of the uh, of the Beaver Kill in particular. Good. Good. Yeah. That's what we want. So I've been I've been saying that went wrong because a lot of a lot of people have controversy with these these diff the Willow Wee Mock or the Willow Wee Mech. It depends on where you're from in the Catskills. So that's what I thought. Uh, some people say Willow Wee Mech and some people see say Willow Wee Mock. Okay. Um yeah, so I've I've noticed so northern Catskills, Green County and Delaware County will say Willow Wee Mech. Mm-hmm. And then Southern Delaware County into Sullivan County say Willow Wee Mock. Okay. And then awesome. Ulster County folks just kind of say well, whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Because it's a little bit towards the river. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Excellent. Um, so yeah, so welcome guests to the night. We'll, we'll Will and we're going to talk about the Beaver Kill and the Willow Wee Mock Valley. Um, so Will, um, how about you give a little bit of your your a background of yourself to the listeners? Sure. Yeah, I've been a licensed guide now for. Uh, 15 years um, and I kind of started just uh, leading hikes for hiking clubs. And one of my friends ran across a licensed guy He called me up and he's like, you know, you can get paid to be a, you know, you can, you be a guide. And I was like, yeah, for hunting and fishing. He goes, no, 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 for hiking. I was like, bullshit. Why do people do that? Like <laughs> we, we can hikes for free with the, with the 3,500 club and the Catskill mountain club. Why, why would they pay for that? And he says, just call this guy up. So, you know, I called my buddy now and my good friend Dave Servo up and, uh, and he's like, yeah, yeah, come out on a trip with me and see what it's like. And I asked him, you know, what do you need to do? And he's like, you take the test and you got to have these certifications. I'm like, I already have the certifications. Great, cool. Take the test. And, and I, I got into it and uh, I've been doing it. And I started doing a lot of the what I call open enrollment trips where I'm going to post destination and a date thinking that people would be driven towards checking off the, you know, the checklist. And, you know, those are fun at first. You meet a lot of different types of people. Um, you get a lot of people coming up from from the city. And, uh, you know, I kind of started to, to, you know, as I started to do, you know, make work out of something I love, I was like, all right, if I'm going to make the, the thing I love into, into my job, I'm going to make sure I do it in a way that I really enjoy it. So I started to kind of like shift what I'm doing. And now what I really do is a lot of private customized trips. So yes. it could be, you know, you could say, hey, I want to take a, a younger family member out and I want to, you know, show them the ropes for the first time. I'm comfortable with this much. Here's what I'm not comfortable with. I know I, I created an itinerary for you and your family member. We we put it together. You know, I've got a, a grandfather who brings nine of his grandkids out. We've been doing that for the past seven years. Nice. Uh, and it's great. I've got to see them grow. I've got to see some of them like now consider this as an option. They're like, I, I could be a camp counselor. I can be, you know, I could be a guide too. I can, I can do this. You know, I also do a lot of like, uh, corporate trips a lot of a lot of companies are now giving incentives for their you know employees to go out and exercise and i'm Mm. like hey hiking's exercise let's get out in nature it's also good for you to like spend time just out of the (laughs) office and uh what's cool about that is they do like you know company events like twice a year so you know we wind up going to places like minnewaska that can take the volume of a busload of people Mm. um they've got a process for it they're they're fit for the volume like that but then in between that people are like I want to do this like as my regular exercise and get credit for it from the, you know, the company and, you know, they'll, they'll give, give them a stipend and, you know, helps their health insurance and whatever. And I've got people come throughout the year and they're like, tell me what else I can discover. I'm like, Hey, you've been off trail. All right. All right. <laughs> so we start to, start to, you know, wean them, wean them off of the, the comfort of a, of a trail and getting up to a peak and a viewpoint to like, Hey, we're not going to see anything other than like the woods all around us today. Yep. You know, we're actually going to go up and over a mountain and down into a valley. And that's where we're going to settle for the night. So, you know, cool stuff like that. And then, uh, you know, pre-COVID, it's just starting to come back after COVID. But we were doing a lot of school field trips and stuff like that. 
And that's really cool because you get these kids out there and, you know, you got some of them who were psyched. They actually paid attention to what the field trip was and they were like chomping at the bit to go. And then you've got other kids who are like, I don't know. Hey, I didn't read the permission slip. I just had my parents <laughs> sign in. Where are we? <laughs> yeah. So you get, you get that mix, you know, some of them are just, you know, they're, they're just still like in class clown mode. And it's like, all right, now is when I need you to pay attention. Otherwise, you're the one who's definitely getting eaten tonight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. And then they look, they look dead at you eyes like, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, one of my favorite lines, especially when working with youth groups is, and it's not true, but we tell them it is. We tell them we're only responsible for bringing back 80% of the group, and that it's an allowable <laughs> industry standard. And even our insurance guys, so they're like, wait, wait, wait a minute. And we're like, yeah, don't be in the 20%. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Gets them to pay attention really fast. And we're like, you'd leave me behind. I'm like, I'm not responsible for bringing all of you back. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what it says in the contract, buddy. Sorry. That's That snaps them too real quick because they don't want to be in that 20%. <laughs> yeah. So – um. You're a guide or what's uh, upstate adventure guys, correct? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Where, where, you, where are you gonna, located out, out of? Uh, so we'll, I'm based in Kingston. Uh, guide primarily in the Catskills just because that's that's my backyard. That's where I know the most of. I do go up to a portion of the Adirondacks called the St. Regis Canoe Wilderness. I know that area fairly well. And that's my favorite canoe spot in the summer. Um, it's, I mean, just you could spend... 10 days out there and still need more time mm -hmm. it's that fast and it's it, it's so much to see up there really good fishing um you know other than that uh pre-covid i was going to, to either coast of canada i'd go to uh vancouver to vancouver island the west coast trail out there and then i'd go up to uh newfoundland and do like gross morn uh do the you know stretches of the appalachians in there and stuff like that and a lot of that once you get out of the parks uh, this is vast stretches of bushwhacking, and that's just dense spruce, birch. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, you stumble across a moose, and you both kind of look at each other, and you're like, ah, oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> Which one of us go? Like, basically, it's the human that wets himself first, but you're like. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's like, okay, can I can I hide behind something? You know, they're not mm -hmm. that swift. So, like, sometimes you can, you know, but other times you're just like, oh, man, well, how the heck am I going to get myself out of this? Yeah. <laughs> But uh, so I'm looking forward to that coming back because they just opened up. So uh, make a couple trips up there preliminary, see who's who's you know still around. Uh, I used a lot of local guides up there just to kind of help, you know, with logistics and stuff like that. Where are you? Uh, where are you from? So I grew up in Connecticut, but I've been coming up to the Catskills since I was a little kid. I've got a cousin who's 16 years older than me, and he's an avid outdoorsman. And you know, I'm the second oldest of six, so uh, you know. My yeah. mom was always looking for a way to get us out of the house. She's like, you like camping? Your cousin CJ likes camping. Go camping. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he's, he's uh, you know, a fisherman, a hunter, loves camping. So he was always scouting a new place like, you know, oh, I heard somebody got a big brown trout here or somebody got a big buck. So he was always looking for something. So I would always go on these adventures. For me, it was a camping trip. For him, it was also scouting new places, learning stuff and you know, so I've been coming up here after college. I had a uh, an opportunity to to move up here and live for free. You know, so it's like, oh, huh? that that's as much better than what my parents are asking me to do. They want me to pay rent for the the room I've lived in for free up until now. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I got their point right. I'm supposed to be responsible now, but uh, yeah. you know, so I moved up here and I never looked back. And uh, you know, I've been here ever since. You know, kind of bounced around a couple different things. And then once I settled on guiding, I was like, this is it. You know, yeah. it keeps me in touch with, with what I love doing, how I love spending my time. And it lets me kind of, you know, meet and connect with other people, share my passion, also relive those moments of discoveries. There's things, I, and I've walked past on probably 10 trips that season. And then all of a sudden on the 11th trip, I got someone who's like, hey, what's this? And it's like, oh, yeah. Oh, that is yeah. Pretty cool. I, it's just normal to me now. Yeah. And you, know, you have that aha moment again where you're like, yeah, that's right. I, I'm pretty lucky. I, you know, I get to walk past this thing all the time. And then you get to kind of share that moment of, yeah, this is, this is what we're looking at here. You know, that is a rock with five different types of moss on it, or that is a yeah. view of you know, the Hudson, Hudson River. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's, it's a cool job. It's definitely a, a really neat job. Do you don't mind me asking, how, how old are you? Uh, 44, November 28th. Oh, you're, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't say you're young, but you're, you're young to, to be doing this for 15 years and stuff like that. That's awesome. 
good fresh air, you know? <laughs> yeah. You, yeah. I, you know, I, I was always passionate about it and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's one of those things where I just, once I knew I could get paid for it, I was like, Oh, that's a no brainer. Hell yeah. <laughs> You now, know, it's always it, been me paying to get to places or, or just, you know, to stay overnight or buy. And now I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I could subsidize adventures and, you know, do this in a way where I'm still having a blast too. Yeah. Uh, you know, really, that's that's what a dream job should be. You should be having fun at every moment while you're doing it. There you go. Definitely. So now is it just uh, hiking that you do or do you also do fishing, fly fishing, stuff like that? So we do hiking. Uh Camping, paddling. I had a fishing guide, but he just moved away. So I'm looking for someone else to kind of fill in. I've got some fishing guides that I work with. So I've got some some people that I trust. Mm-hmm. So you know, we've kind of did. We've kind of you know, in the past, either, either refer to them to to that person. They either go with them for the day and come back to me. Sometimes these guys will come into camp. Sometimes they'll just go with them and just do a fishing trip with them if they're just looking for a day trip. So. You know, that's, that's one of the cool things about the guiding community is, is we're pretty close. You know, a lot of us, you know, every once in a while we'll stumble across a big one. And it's like, ah, you know, I'm going to need a hand yeah. with this. So instead of trying to manage our own staff all the time, because we're never going to have consistent volume to do that. You know, there's peaks and valleys in the season. You don't want to lay people off. So we wind up working with each other. And, you know, it's a really it's a it's a great community. You know, to be able to know and trust these people, a lot of these people I've hiked with, so I know, you know, like a Greg Calabrese or a Mo Lemire or a Dave DeServo, um, yeah. you know, I, I know what they've done, what they're capable of, I know what their expertise is, I know their strong suits, you know, so it's it, it's great. And same thing with the fishing guides, you know, like a Mark Lodi, a Todd Spire, uh, you know, Oli Molo, you know, uh, some of those guys, Phil Eagleton. You know, you just, it's, if this is what the person's asking for and that's the region, that's the river, that's, that's, that's the guide to send them to or, or to bring in on the trip. Yeah. You're like, you're like the, the, I'm pretty sure like the fourth or fifth guide I've interviewed about the Catskills. So, and you guys, like, like you said, you're, you're tight. You guys are tight. Like, you know, if Greg has, as a client one day, he's just like, Hey, maybe check out this guy this day. And, or, you know, you guys will contact each other and uh, work things out. So the, the client, the person uh, that wants this trip, we'll get that trip and not have to be, like you said, turned down and we'll get the experience of the Catskills. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, you know, it's, it's such a beautiful thing that we can do that. And then we know we can rely on each other, you know, and it's uh, a lot of other industries, especially, you know, when you are small business, wind up being a little competitive and, uh, you know, here, these are people I hike with, you know, it's, you know, I, I enjoy the rare moments when we all have a, a day off together <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, and we get to get out on the trail. I'm, I'm uh, fingers crossed. I'm, I'm going out on the trail with, uh, with Mo and a bunch of people on, uh, on Friday They're nice. going doing uh black dome and blackhead. So uh, awesome. it'll be the first time in a while where, where I've had some time. Actually, last time I hiked with Mo, he tagged along because the client also knew him and, and he'd reached out and said, I want to come along on this one. She's like, ah, absolutely. <laughs> Sweet. See, that, that's, that's awesome. Community right there, a tight community. That's, yeah. that's what it makes it good. Yeah. Well, excellent. Thank for your, for your background. So let's, let's get into the big discussion, the Beaver Kill and the Wheeluimac Valley. So a lot of, of that, that history before the white man came, came is, is very like, not, I wouldn't say blurred and wiped out, but it's it's not it's not a lot is there. Why do you think that it, that is so scarce of of having not that much of history? It's not crystal clear, and I, you know I've been learning more and more about this. Uh, I you know I did a trip just before COVID with uh, the Ramapo Lenape, where they paddled with the stretches of uh, some of their ancestral waterways. They they paddled on the uh, the roundout, so. They couldn't get into the Roundout Reservoir because they're not allowed to do recreational paddling, only fishing there. So they went right downstream, did that, and came to High Falls, and then they didn't portage around there. But you know, it, it was neat to kind of hear from them that as different groups got dispersed, their stories got carried with them and didn't get quite left behind. So what got left behind was, you know, kind of like this game, game of telephone. You know, it was just the big bullet points, and it was very often told in a way that was skewed that really kind of left some things out. Uh, you know, there were groups even within say the same tribal family that warred with each other. And I think, think about it, you know, say 
we're all New Yorkers, right? We all are people who live in Kingston, right? And all of a sudden, we're all from the same family, too. Doesn't mean we're necessarily going to get along. You, you could be living next to family, you know, in this area, and you know, and that, and just be like, you know, I don't like that. Stuff. Yeah. So you know, and, and it's interesting to kind of hear that because a lot of that stuff gets glossed over. A lot of the the intertribal uh, or you know uh, stuff happening between clans gets kind of you know blurred. And, and it, what what's missing there is how important these areas were to them and what it, what was kind of worth fighting for. Yeah. And an area like that, it did represent a lot of significance. There was an abundance of game there. There was an abundance of fish there. There was an abundance of wild food, you know, plants and, and, and stuff growing in on, on trees there. You had nuts, berries, you know, fruit on tree, you know, all this stuff there. So they, it really was kind of this, this land of plenty for them. And then you also had trails going uh, one to the Delaware and one to the Susquehanna from the Hudson. So you could have these, these groups going back and forth with the seasons, you know, out to fish the Hudson, up to fish the, you know, the, the, the upper stretches of the Delaware or, or the Susquehanna, uh, and then game in between and then farming and villages in between. And they, they'd have to pass through. So, you know, as they would pass through, they'd interact with each other uh, and, you know, they'd use these natural boundaries to kind of say, well, this is our area and this is kind of where we hunker down. We're going to pass through along here. Uh, and the, the Beaverkill Valley, willow uh, and then stretching north, the uh, east branch of the, uh, uh, of the Delaware were kind of this natural boundary. And as time shifted on too, you know, there was different kind of acquisitions and different stresses. So it went from being kind of you know, more of an Algonquin stronghold and different, you know, periods of history there to, you know, Iroquois coming and putting pressure. Uh, and then as Europeans came through and dispersed them further in their own directions, uh, you know, uh, Iroquois kind of north and east, and then the Algonquins kind of, you know, further west towards Wisconsin and, and areas like that, you know, kind of the history got, you know, e even further mercury, uh, murkier there. Uh, if you drive around the area, you'll see things like T Tuscarora Lane, Tunis Lane, yeah. um, and this this is the la the very end stages of of the Native American kind of involvement and really inhabit like you know inhabitation there. The Tuscarora were from the Carolinas, and they kind of split off. They're like, hey, we're being we're being encroached on by you know by the Europeans here. We want to you know get the heck out. Some stayed behind. And the group that actually stayed behind in their ancestral lands, interestingly enough, are not federally recognized. Mm. That boggles my mind. Wow. That's another that's another discussion. Yeah. The group that went north and eventually wound up, you know, kind of out uh, near the Great Lakes does have federal recognition. Again, another story. But they were the last ones to pass through. Uh, and it, they left it, really an indelible mark because the time they came through, they had more settlement of Europeans there. They had more interaction with the Europeans. They weren't quite as fleeting. They weren't run off. Um, so there was more time to interact with them and get and, and have them kind of like leave a mark, um, you know, on the area to the point where there's a Tunis pond there. And if you go a little further up past Andes on your way out of Andes, there's another Tunis pond. Yeah. The one to the north and to the, the south, correct? Yeah. 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 Interesting. And so will part of that is, is Tunis's impact on the area? Yeah. Um, so Willowemock is that? That's native, correct? That is, yeah, yeah. Does that was that like a last name of someone, or was it? Is, does it mean something? Uh it means something, and I, I've heard very different things. So I'm not, you know, I'm not quite sure what it means. Yeah. Um, you know. Uh, hey, that's it, all good. I was just curious. I was curious. Yeah. No. It, it, from. Uh, from what I've heard, I've heard it, it, it speaks to um, the abundance of fish in the in the water. Not not sure how accurate that is, but you know when you look at how, how many trout are in there, it's it's a plausible explanation. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, but oh, interesting. Yeah, it, yeah. I was just curious. Um, yeah. So basically, the Indians cherish this so much because, like you said, there's an abundance of game. You know, the fish. I'm guessing the soil there was absolutely fantastic because, you know, they have the mountains to both sides. So everything kind of runs down and gets situated in the Beaver Kill River and the Willow Emoc River, correct? Yep. Yep. So you've got that area that's kind of guarded. So the first, first big area of abundance 
Um, so if you enter in through the Willowy Wild Forest in the south, um, you come up the Neversink Hardenburg Trail, yep. eventually hit back into the Big Indian Wilderness. And then the trail kind of, you know, the, the, the river comes one way, kind of takes a hard turn, and then the trail kind of takes a hard turn with it. If you kind of go upstream there, you get into this big wide open bowl that's surrounded by, you got, du- you know, Double Top South, Double Top, Graham, and then some of the little lesser peaks, uh, sub peaks over there. That's a big wide open bowl. It uh, has a lot of beaver activities. So it's got a lot of diversity as far as, you know, aquatic life, uh, you know, birds and all that. But it's got berries. There's raspberries, there's blackberries, there's wild strawberries, there's blueberries. And on the southern facing, some of the southern facing ledges, there's evidence of them being burned over. Uh, they were burned over to promote the blueberry. Yeah, growth. yeah. So, it's, you know, you can see a record in the forest of this interaction with, you know, the early inhabitants. And, you know, I mean, I do trips there throughout the seasons and it's just you never without something to kind of snack on. So I can imagine, you know, if you're actually spending your days there and that's that's your fishing grounds like you're, you're not bummed out. Like, you know, you're picking a, a, a you know, pouch full of berries, you're. You know, grabbing something over here. You got some nuts over there. Uh, you know, then you get your yourself some trout. Maybe you know, snag some game. You know, along the yeah. way, it, it's it's very abundant. So definitely can see why it left a mark on, on them. And it's also just you know, I'd say it's just a damn beautiful place too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know, um, a lot of I, uh, you know, I've I've read it. You you sent me a bunch of uh, unit management plans and stuff like that. You know, when they had that. But I've also read in books uh, another reason why. I think that the Indians were there uh, so much and the more of more of the Native Americans and stuff uh, f- kind of were there was because they didn't have the steep valleys and stuff like that. It was a little bit more open than the other areas. They could farm. They could uh, they could hunt a little bit easier than trying to go up a steep slope and looking down and stuff. Is that is that correct? Yes. So on their on their passage, you know, from from one area to another, it was an area that was easier to settle in. Um, because you had those wide open areas in between. You think of the Eastern Catskills, you know, you think of like a Platte Clove, a Catterskill Clove, even a Deep Notch. You've got these tall, towering mountains and narrow valleys. Mm. So there's not a lot going on in between. Yeah. <laughs> um, it doesn't really open up, let the light in. So you don't got, you know, you don't have the ability to, to get the light to the understory to, to really have abundance there. Uh, you also don't have, you know, uh, an alluvial plain you don't have a section where the river kind of slows down periodically floods kind of turns over the soil and brings and deposits nutrients so you've got that in some of those stretches of river naturally there um so you do have opportunity for that and then you've got you know areas where you know there's just you know the forest was kind of just set up right for them yeah. you know? and it's beautiful you know you kind of I don't know if, if people if if they don't go to the Villa, Willowemic and uh, the Beaverco Valley, they got to because you know it might not have all the the high peaks, but God damn it is stunning just to even drive through. Yeah, it's it's one of those drives where you're just like, wow, where did civilization go? Yeah, and when am I going to see it next? I mean, if you come in from County Route 47, like you're going to to Slide Mountain, and then you you know you go up. Uh, black bear road and then you know go around pole road and then you know work your way kind of around the mountains that way uh and then over to beaver kill it's you're just you're out there you know and some of those roads there aren't really residents out there yeah. there's seasonal hunting sh- hunting you know cabins mm. uh or hunting camps you know uh, it's hey, you look out there and you're like, wow it's, there's, there's something special about this you know even the people that did develop here cherish this in a way where they don't you they don't overuse yeah um, you know, and it's a, it's a it's a pretty special spot it's definitely uh you know it's unique in the way that it wasn't touched as much as stuff even just you know 20 miles away from it yeah. uh it was so remote that it was kind of off-putting for the early europeans to get in there you know the first europeans didn't step foot in there until lewis and clark had already you know reached the Columbia and we're on their way to the Pacific. Oh. And uh, so it's it, to put that in, t- you know, like, all right, you know, you, you've got, you know, Hudson coming and then 
you know, all the way in, in the early 1800s, the first European finally steps foot in that area. And then it still wasn't even that the, the beaver kill and willow weemocks still weren't even really developed until the mid 1800s. Um, areas around it had started to Sullivan County stuff had started to encroach roads were being built around it. Mm -hmm. But stuff didn't really poke in and get into, you know, close to the interior where the headwaters are. Um, and until there was, you know, kind of successful tanneries, you know, further south and people had a little bit of money and they could say, I'm going to go up here, clear some land out for a farm, cut some trees down, bring them to the mill. Uh, but even that didn't last because it wound up being so remote that it wasn't really didn't present a viable opportunity to develop yeah. and create a settlement. And the distance traveling from, you know, the Beaver Hill and we will we mock. And going to the Hudson for for stuff is just an enormous amount of time, especially 1800s yeah. when you don't have freaking uh, like trains and and buses and stuff like that, or not buses, but like cars and stuff like that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And interestingly enough, uh, this is one of the cool cool little things. Um, some of the areas were easier to travel by ox, and then once automobiles came in, it, you couldn't you know you couldn't <laughs> deal. True. With, you know, because an ox could drag a sled over some pretty rough terrain. You can't get a Jeep through, you know, some of the stuff that an ox can just power through and drag you over. Yeah. So interestingly enough, some of the little roads that kind of started to encroach on the on the on the core of this it's still very wild. Just you know, kind of big once cars came along, it was like nope, yep. not an option. I'm not paying to improve it. It's not a viable, you know, like who's going to pay to improve this, this, you know, 10 mile stretch of road. So just so I can get my, my car. Mm -hmm. And, and you got to think that, uh, that ox also had their hooves and stuff like that could dig into the ground, pull stuff off. You know, Jeep yeah. does have horsepower. Jeep does have like, you know, big tires and stuff like that to grip on there, but it can't grip like an ox with its, with its front two feet and then its back two pushing forward. So that's yeah, a great point. Exactly. That's a great point. Wow. I never really thought about that yeah so coming coming south from the end of dry brook road the dry brook trail so the blue trail that you know eventually leads to the little side spur trail that goes up towards uh, balsam lake mountain that was an old road and it was essentially an ox path oh wow uh, and there was an attempt to turn it into a jeep road and it was just it was unsuccessful um you know you see where the first half the northern half it had been improved to allow access to the fire tower but having it, you know, a thoroughfare that connected all the way through to the south to, to, to Beaver Kill Road, it was just never viable. It, it would wash out too much. It was too steep. It was too eroded. Mm. Jeeps would get stuck. So, you know, as an ox path, totally worked. You know? <laughs> crazy. It's crazy <laughs> stuff to think about. Like, like it, it's so great. This is why I do this is, you know, the education come to the people. They're just probably going to be like, holy crap, I never really thought of that. And yeah. that's why I love it. So um, we talked about, you know, Tunis Pond, the two Tunis Ponds and stuff like that. Um, in one of the the plans, the unit management plan that they you sent me, I remember reading that this area was called the land of the Tunis. Uh, can you explain that? So Tunis was uh, one of the Tuscarora who moved up here. And initially he you know, made a mark with a lot of local hunters and trappers. Mm -hmm. Uh, but then they kind of grew weary of him, uh, and especially once he started to, you know, kind of court one of the, uh, you know, one of the, you know, local native, uh, local, you know, uh, settlers there. I mean, as many of the stories from this time, you know, kind of go, um, and then he was on the outs with everyone. But uh, as the legend goes, and I don't, you know, it's, this is one of those things where, it's, you know, I don't know how, how much of this is true or, or not. I said he found it's a positive lead. Um, but guarded that secret. And because it was so coveted, um, he kind of started to, you know, win people over. And first it was just bartering and trading and then kind of tolerating him. And then it was kind of like them growing to like, you know, this guy's pretty good. Like, you know, he's got good knowledge of the area. You know, he really lived in and amongst the area, hunted, trapped, and you know, forged the area. So they started to kind of like look at him with a different set of eyes afterwards. But he never gave up his secret of, of where his stash was. And he would always, uh, from what I've heard, always refer to different areas very vaguely, which is why everyone thinks that Tunis Pond is uh, in, in the north nice. going towards, you know, past Andes was, was his, his site. 
or Tunis Pond way back in, you know, the Beaverkill Valley up there was his site. You know, both of them are viable spots. Both of them are places he probably, you know, fished and hunted and was very active in it. They're not far enough away where it, it wouldn't be unreasonable that he would have popped up in both of those locations, especially if he was bartering and trading with, you know, with those settlers. So, you know, again, going back to the fact that he was one of the last Native Americans to, to really inhabit the area. And he was one that made such a mark with local sportsmen and hunters. Um, there is a, a hunting club named the Tunis Club. So, nice. you know, that, that legend, he, he left such a, uh, in a, an indelible mark on that community. And, and in that area in particular, you know, northern Sullivan County and Delaware County, you know, a lot of folks grow up fishing, hunting, you know, that's, that's been a part of the way you kind of supplement what goes in, you know, on your table and in your freezer. Yeah. Um, so and it's just, it's, you know, it's a great activity. There's not a lot of other activities other than spending time outdoors. Um, you know, and a lot of folks out there spend most of the day outdoors anyway on a farm. So for this, you know, it's kind of an escape to do something fun and, you know, a different way to kind of spend their time and, you know, kind of a way to relax, you know, you know, toiling away on a farm. It's, you know, I can sit and have, you know, some peace and solitude in there. So to, you know, to get some knowledge and gain that knowledge, um, you know, and from what I've heard from, from, you know, locals who grew up there, you know, anytime an old time would bring them out, they'd tell them tales of Tunis. Oh, nice. And this is how he hunted, or this is one of his areas where he would trap and, you know, you get the biggest pelts in here, or, you know, you'll find the, you know, the, this area is dense with grouse and he used to hunt. So he kind of left this mark of like, you know, especially with that, that outdoorsman, you know, that, that woodsman's, you know, kind of sporting uh, community. Interesting. They, they kind of got passed down in folklore and who knows, who knows which portions are true and, and which aren't, but the fact that he left a mark that just kind of kept resonating. Yeah. You know, yeah. Whether, you know, how much the story changed, we'll never know, you know, but the fact that he made, you know, such a mark there, it, it really kind of tied his name in there. And I think it's funny that there's two ponds and, and you know, depending on who you ask, they'll insist, you know, oh, that this, this, this is where he used to camp. Yep. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so now um, what, what stinks is, of course, you said before that all this information is kind of like blurred, blurred and stuff like that. And their pages missing and stuff like that, because of course the telling of the times gets so far only so far and then like the pages some pages are missed out or some pages are left behind and yeah. that's what sucks is because you know native americans uh, of course were the first to be here we're, we're the first to settle in our area we're the first to explore our area they didn't like the the eastern catskills because they thought it was dark they thought it was um like evil territory and stuff like that so coming over to the delaware the beaver kill the will we was their area basically because of that and you know it just thinks that all this this history is kind of missing a lot of pages because that's a big part in catskill mountain history that's it, it really is and you know i mean you can you can do things uh you know i i don't know if you've had the opportunity to hike with uh dr kudish with with mike kudish definitely but you can do things like, you know, kind of read the record that, that's written there in the uh, in the forest itself and then go back and see what that correlates to in written records uh, and kind of see where those clues are. And then it kind of helps you get an eye for what's going on. You can also just look at like, OK, you know, once you start to talk to folks who have a couple of the pages that were missing, maybe it's still not the whole story. And you start to look at, OK, these were their habits. These were their behaviors. What what? I mean, if I were looking at a map and saying, I'm coming out to fish, you know, the river, the Hudson in the, in the spring for stripers, but my village is over here, say, in the Papacton Valley or, you know, in, in the Beaverkill Valley or, you know, a little further south in Sullivan County, how would I travel from A to B? Yeah. And that's really, you know, you know, it's so this, this, you know, essentially two main routes going out and, you know, it's. 209 and 28 and there's a reason they're there it's because those are the routes that were traveling yeah. whether you took you know the river in a canoe part of the time back then or whether you followed along um those are the routes that and you think about it you're now you're in a valley so you're skirting around the highest peaks you're not you're not doing that back-breaking labor that yeah yeah <laughs> you know they weren't 
giving out patches back then. So. Yeah, yeah, no way, no way. <laughs> it was it was about being efficient. How could I get from from my you know my spring fishing grounds back to my farm to to bring what I just caught back to my family? How can I then get you know the fields fertilized? And, and the crops sown, and and then you know head out to you know spring hunting grounds, and then you know get some you know some game in here. Yeah. So there was constant back and forth and travel, and you know they're not about like, hey, I'm going to go up the top of this mountain because it looks like it's fun. They're about like, hey, I've got I've got what food I can carry with me. I've got what food I can find along the way, and I'm not I'm not going to burn through calories just to just to impress myself. I'm looking for the path of least resistance here. Mm-hmm. But also the path that's going to pay off. If I stick near water, I know I have fish. So you know, so if I got fish, if I got water here and I got forest there, I've got game and fish. If you just go into the forest, it's just game. Yeah. You know, and if there's no water, how are you going to drink? Yeah. So you know, a lot of the paths they took followed the water and followed around those high peaks, and then they'd hit these little sweet spots. You know. The Ashokan Valley was one that was yeah. closer out here, so you know that was that was an area that was that was kind of settled until it was drowned under the reservoir. Yeah. You know the Papacton Reservoir, you know going out there at the Roundout, uh, and all these little valleys in between the Beaver Kill, you know areas like Downsville Arena and stuff like that. Those were areas that prior to us changing and shifting them, uh, you know the way we did, um, were really it was an essential thoroughfare for them. You know, and it was a way where they would communicate from village to village, from family to family. Sometimes they'd run into a skirmish. They'd be coming back. They'd have some, you know, you know, a good haul from the Hudson. Some other folks didn't have such good luck. And it was like, you got more than you need. Yeah. Let me take that. So there, you know, that's where a lot of that, that stuff. And, and, you know, that's, that's kind of, that's where we kind of lose or gloss over stuff in history. Um, we just hear about things in general terms. We think about them in very general terms. And sometimes we even romanticize them and brush over the fact that these were people too. They had their ups and downs. You know, sometimes they even had their, you know, their, their things that weren't that great. Yeah. You know, but it's, yeah, it's, it's a shame because, you know, aside from the fact that the stories were spread so far, you, you brought up a really good point. The time has gone on so long. Now it's really hard to piece that whole thing back together. And, and really, you know, double check and know exactly what happened. Yeah. You know, we know it was, we know it was a deep and very important uh, part of this, and it shaped. I mean, it shapes, you know, kind of how we developed. How each stage of transportation came in afterwards yep. was really kind of taken from that blueprint of how they got around. You know, by by river or by foot back then. You know, some of them came in afterwards and were like, "I cut an ox path here." That'd be easier, mm-hmm. you know. Okay, now I can move more stuff in deeper. Great ox path. Then it became, you know, I'll put in a little skid road here, you know, still an ox path, but maybe now maybe I can get some horses on there. And then it was like maybe I'll put in a train line here. Yeah, you know, maybe I'll build a build a real improved road here. Yeah. So it's it's interesting, you know. You look at those paths, you know, uh, the old Sun Road, the old Hunter Road. Um, Sun Road was eventually, you know, it started as a as a footpath and became, you know, an ox ox road, and now parts of it are are the roads we drive on. Yeah, and uh, coming from Kingston out towards uh, essentially the Susquehanna. Yeah, it's really wicked stuff. Yeah. Like like you said, like twenty three, twenty three A. That's how they traveled, yeah. following the rivers and following the easel path of least resistance. Really, it's just fascinating stuff. And then you know, as we're we're moving on talking about this, we talk about. Basically, we're talking about roads being built and stuff. The white man starts to come in and plays a whole different role in the Native American uh, culture. Now, did oh, these yeah. guys, you know, a lot of a lot of the history of the Native Americans and the the white man came in. Were were, were the Native Americans kind of pushed out, bullied out, you know, or were were was it like a time of like, hey, we'll purchase this land from you? Only it was a bad deal for for the Indians for Native Americans. So, you know, and I've heard this story told a couple different ways. Um, of course. You know, yeah. some have more detail, some are more glossed over. Uh, but essentially what happened is after after the British kind of pushed the Dutch out, because you know, originally the Dutch came in here and they're like, we want, we want pelts, we want furs. Mm-hmm. And initially there was trade and then eventually there was too much demand and you had the, the whole Sopus Wars and stuff like that where, where the natives were just like, no, you're putting your, your, 
you're putting too much on us. You're taking too much. You're not giving us anything back. Nobody's giving us time to plant our crops. So, you know, there, there was that period. And then you had the British come in and they're like, we do things differently. You can own stuff. This can be yours and you can use it the way you want it. So they kind of introduced the concept of ownership, but it wasn't really felt or, or appreciated the same way. But it was kind of like, all right, I had trouble with those guys. So you're telling me if, if I sign this thing and you'll agree to the terms on it, that, that this is mine and you won't bug me and I can do what I want here. It's kind of like, all right, we can, let's see, let's try this. Let's move forward with this. So there, initially there was this gravitation towards, let's give this a shot. You know, and then there were some, I would say, less than, you know, less than scrupulous deals. Uh, uh, essentially, the area that the Beaver Kill and Willow Wimock Valleys fall into were part of the Hardberg Pap, which was millions of acres oh, yeah. that were essentially granted by Queen Anne to you know, a bunch of wealthy you know, Dutch merchants. And that land, essentially, they, they got the rights to that land by paying the Native Americans. So they said, hey, if you sign this, this deal, we'll give you, you know, this money. And so essentially, the beaver kill in Willow Umak was, was signed over for the equivalent of uh, 60 pounds back then. Oh, wow. So it, it boggles my mind, you know. Now that's, you know, it's like, oh, man. Yeah. So, and then yeah, there, there's a house with like like 20 acres there for 1.5 million now. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Can I give you 60 pounds sterling? I'll take that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, maybe maybe I'll do that online. I'll, I'll be like, listen, back in the Native American days, they bought this land for 60 pounds. What can we what, what yeah. can we do with that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, was, was there a lot of bad confrontation or was it more of like, I wouldn't say good deals but was it more of like not like you know out west where they the, the cowboys came in and killed all the indians and took over their land it's more of what happened was there was just more encroachment and encroachment and encroachment and it just uh, wasn't it, 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 it that was really the biggest pressure was they would say hey you know we're only gonna buy this from you and use this this way and then you know you know family gets successful they have Back then, a slew of kids. Those kids need more land to farm to feed their kids. And as the generations grew, there just became more and more. Incredible. That was really the biggest pressure here. Um, what accelerated kind of why the Algonquins and Iroquois split off in different directions uh, was also, you know, the revolution yeah. and then the War of 1812. One side took the British. One side, yeah. you know, so that really kind of accelerated who, who was fleeing north for for you know reservations and and who is you know just getting pressured and pushed further west yep. um so you know that plays a role in it there wasn't really as much of we're just gonna like come in here and shoot them up and 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 do that that didn't really happen until until later and until sediments out west so that didn't we didn't kind of see that kind of pressure but there was just like hey you know what we decided that deal we made we're not gonna honor it we need this for our farm but you know you can you know you can farm here too a little bit, and then it was like, well, but we don't want you doing those things here. So it was just kind of like, you know what? Yeah, you've already destroyed the land. You cut down the forest. I can't hunt here, so I, I'm, I'm going to go that way. Yeah, I'm not getting any pressure if I go if I keep going west. So that's really you know kind of what what happened here. Freaking white um, people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's you know as. As it grew and grew, it just you know it, it made it untenable here. Yeah, um, I mean that's a that's a good that's it, a good way to say it. I'm uh, you know like they 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 wanted not to say that the the white man wanted more, but they did. You know they they grew their families and they were like, hey, you know we have another family now here. We need to grow this area, and then they chopped it down, and then they put more stuff, and then the Indians, the Native, the Americans. Sorry, I keep saying Indians. I'm very sorry. Um, they kept saying, like, you know, you're destroying this place. Now we have no purpose here. Let's get out. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it wasn't that they didn't farm. They just farmed at a different scale, you know. So, and the Europeans were were primarily about farming. Yeah. So, and, and to a scale that was just putting so much more pressure on there, you know. So, it it, it, it accelerated at a pace where it, it didn't leave room for the natives to live in a way uh, where they felt like this place was, you know, was the place they knew it as anymore. Yeah. 
So um later like as the white man came in, um, of course they they kinda bought the area, took over the area and stuff like that. Now we have American history coming in really big as in the Catskills, as we know tanning industry started bloomed the american history now was that yeah. was that the same way over there in the beaver kill and Willamette area so it came later uh and, and you're like well why, why if they had the same you know supply and and stock of uh, of hemlocks why would it come later part of it was it was remote and inaccessible and part of it was because the stuff that was closer to shipping you know whether that was a canal or you know a, a, a big river like the hudson or you know railroad out there um was because that stuff was was there so it was like we're going to start here where it's easy to, to get the stuff moving and you know naturally as, as in industry does they don't really think about you know when's my supply gonna end yeah because they're just like how can i make it bigger how can i make it bigger yep. No, I, I gotta I gotta send a guy, you know, another mile down the road to get bark. No, no, two miles down the road to get bark. Now all of a sudden, shoot, we're out of bark. So these massive tanneries like Prattsville, like the Phoenix tannery in, in Woodland Valley and, and some of the other tanneries around there literally work themselves out of a supply. So there was still a demand for you know hides to be tanned. There was still not another process to do so. The chemical process hadn't really been, you know, developed yet. So it was still looking to strip bark off trees. So all eyes went west. And so, you know, the Phoenicia East Branch Trail. So the one that goes from Woodland Valley, you know, kind of uh, up over, you know, um, you know uh, just below Giant's Ledge and then uh, yep. over towards, you know, essentially Denning. That was built to transport tannery equipment. Uh, to start new tanneries oh, out wow. there. And I was, it was basically, they looked that way and they're like, hey, we got more trees over here. Let's, all right, let's, let's go for wow. it. So, and, you know, that's what it was. And, and what's interesting is that came later, you know, uh, so that would be mid, mid 1800s uh, and kind of finished out the, the, the history of tanning was, was more in Sullivan County. Um, there's a saying you'll hear amongst historians that the boots that won the Civil War were tanned in Sullivan County. And that's because those were the tanneries that were around and active with a supply of hemlocks at that time. Oh, you know, wow. your stuff in, in Greene County and Ulster County had already kind of chewed through their supply of, of you know, viable, uh, you know, hemlocks to, to, to strip the bark from. Wow. So wicked. Yeah, it's pretty wild when you when you think about it that way. You know, and at the peak of tanning, uh, this is a fact that has always boggled my mind. They were shipping hides from as far away as Argentina. So you think about it. We know Argentina now for steaks and stuff like that. So they've been a long, long history of uh, of, of cattle ranching and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So they were sending their hides all the way up to the Catskills to be tanned oh, because wow. these tanneries were so big and so productive. And so widely, you know, uh, reputed, uh, you know, but uh, a reputation around the world. Wow, I've never, I've never known of that. I just known that, you know, we had a great tanning industry. I never knew that different countries and stuff like that would be like, hey, send this up to the Catskills. That's yeah, wow. Yeah, part of why tanning started here was, you know, Europe had had depleted its stock of 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 you know trees to strip bark from or, or natural sources of tannins like that. So, you know, as Napoleon kind of, you know, led his stuff over there, they were like, oh, shoot, you know, we're, we're running out of leather for saddles for the horses. We're running out of boots. We're running out. So as Europeans came over here, they were like, there's this region that's chock full of hemlocks. So it really keyed them into it. And in the early 1800s, they started stripping bark, um, you know, and it was generally in the areas that were settled along major rivers or major thoroughfares, er areas where they had improved roads and, and stuff like that. Mm. You know, something where you can get the stuff to and from market. You know, you get the raw material in and get the stuff out to the people who are paying you the money for it. Mm. But as time went on, it was like, we got to go to where the supply is. Like, we got stuff. Let's let's build. Now we now we have the money because we've been doing this for decades. Let's build a road. Yeah. You know, and you look at you look at something like the Phoenicia East Branch Road. And you're like, that was, a, that, that was a viable road. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Incredible. Yeah. yeah. I'll have to get some pictures yeah. of that and uh, and post some of the the pictures of that. That's really cool to, to, to picture that that was once a road. Yeah. You know, of course, it's, it's, it's oxen, but still, like, 
you, know, you think about them drag, dragging bark sleds and dragging, you know, tanning vats that they no longer needed out east, out to Sullivan County. Yeah. And just, you know. Hundreds and hundreds of pounds. Back. Yeah. Yeah. So as we, as the tanning industry went on, uh, a new industry came into the Catskills. And that was, of course, the railroad industry, which boosted American history, economy, stuff like that by like the, the thousands. Yeah. So how was that in that, in this part of the area? Cause I know, you know, the, did the Delaware and the Hudson come through there or what, what was. So to the North, you had the Delaware Ulster railroad. Delaware, yeah. uh, and to the South, you had what later became the O and W. So that, that was New York Western. Uh, and then it became New York Western Ontario. And, you know, mm. so what did that, what did that bring to the area as in, in terms of like, one of the things that railroads did uh, to attract riders was they would create these little postcards or pamphlets and show all these exotic things that you could do. Nice. So it created this it created this very accessible remoteness. So now all of a sudden, within a day's trip or have a por- portion of a day's trip, you could be in an area that felt totally wild. You you could catch a native brook trout. You know you could. You know, hike a mountain, you could go hunting. You All of this stuff was right there, you know. And for people living down in a city, pre-air conditioning. Yeah. In the summer, when, when things like polio outbreaks and stuff like you, you wanted to get the heck out of there any chance you couldn't, especially during the summer. Mm-hmm. So it was to the point where they, they were competing. They were creating these pamphlets. They were showing off all these, you know, wonderful exotic things you could do. But then they were thinking, how do we, how do we build up this industry so we don't destroy it out, out from underneath us? It was to the point with fishing uh, because the, the Beaverkill, Willowemock area uh, became so renowned for fishing. They were like, okay, we can't just, we can't just fish all the fish out of here. Then, then we're not going to, you know, then our railroad's going to be bust. We can't sell tickets anymore. Right. Yeah. You know, they're literally thinking about this thing as an attraction. And it was to the point where they said, okay, how do we get more fish? How do we get a, a fish? And it was to the point where they were talking with the, you know, essentially they were game wardens back then. They weren't even, you know, conservation officers. Mm. But they said, we need, we need, you know, fries. That's what they, they you know, a small trout called fries. And they said, we need 60,000 of them in this one season, you know. And I said, okay, well, you know, instead of shipping them from another hatchery, we'll, we'll develop a hatchery there. Oh. And today there's still hatcheries out there. Um, you know, you go out the, the hatchery road, yeah. um, you know, it's right off the beaver kill. Uh, and it, it's, it, it's neat to think that, you know, that was such an impact that, 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 that we were like, okay, we got to control the ability to, to maintain they, you know, they, back then they were thinking about it as an attraction. Mm-hmm. As people started to fall in love with it and started to learn about it, they're like, okay, we do need to, you know, really control our behavior around this. And one of the cool things about fishing and fly fishing in, in particular is you really start to, the more you get into it, you start to develop into a citizen scientist because you start to learn about the entomology of bugs, stream temperatures. Yeah. You know, how that's affected by the forest composition. You know, if we lose our hemlocks, our stream temperatures shoot up. Yeah. You know, so if we lose them to Willie Adalgi, our trout are screwed. You know, it's not just we're losing a tree. Yeah. You know, it, our fisheries are screwed. So people really said, you know, oh, especially as, as years progressed, really started to kind of put two and two together. Uh, but the early efforts were just really around business. It was like, how do I keep this cash cow going? Go throw more fish in there every year. So that's where they developed the practices of stocking rivers. Um, interesting, just south of the Willowemock and Beaverkill, you've got the uh, the west branch of the Neversink. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you're driving on County, County Road 47, you pass Slide, you pass Biscuit Brook, and you're heading over towards Black Bear Road, you'll drive along the west branch of the Neversink. At one point in, in this period of time, when people are coming up here to fish, some of these big private fishing clubs are, are developing. On that stretch of river, it was stocked with, with salmon. Oh, wow. So to this day, there is a small population of landlocked salmon that live. They go back and forth from the reservoir to upstream, and that's it. That's that's their existence. You know, They're funky. They don't grow that big because they don't have much habitat. And they kind of look like a weird trout. You're like, what the hell's wrong? With that? Oh, <laughs> that's, that's what it is. Wow. Yeah. 
Yeah. Now, what was the, what was the 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 years of this this railroad industry and the fly fishing industry? Was that the early eight nineteen hundreds? Correct. So it really started to boom in the early 1900s. Okay. So it started to come in and it primarily started to come in for industry. It was getting milk to the city. It was getting charcoal, timber, you know, it moving, moving supplies around. And then as tourism, so that was really, it really was the late 1800s into uh, the, uh, you know, early 1900s where it really tourism became a thing up here. Um, you know, you, you had all these, you know, affluent families coming up here. Uh, so on the, on the Northern side, the Delaware Ulster would bring you into areas like Margaretville or Arkville and you'd have, you know, horse and carriage would take you down the dry brook and then take you to your hunting camps in the Northern edge of, of, you know, so the big, big Indian wilderness portion of the Beaverkill Valley, where to this day, the Rockefellers own and maintain, you know, uh, you know, kind of fishing access rights uh, on a lot of that oh, wow. um it, it, you know so you've got a lot of and then you know you go over the ridge you know to the north in the dry brook there and you've got the gould family which as we know as hikers owns you know double top and graham yeah. so you had a lot of money that was just they all of a sudden had access to this they saw it and they were like we're, we're going to keep this portion of this for ourselves yeah it was interesting as as time went on and they had to manage their assets they're like okay we'll cherry pick the things that we want then the rest will give to this newly found forest preserve so we don't have to pay the taxes on it. People can access that part, but barely because we cut off all access on this side. So they got to cross over a mountain from the other side yeah. to get to Nobody's it. Nobody's going to want to do that so, shit. You know, <laughs> that, 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 that's some back in the day f you money. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Like, you know, I got enough money. I'll let you have this so I don't have to pay for it, but I'm not going to let you have it easy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so at, at this time when the railroads and the, the tourism started to come up there, um, I'm guessing the tourism was mostly, you know, the clean air, but also the fly fishing. When did, when did the fly fishing start coming into game? Uh, so that was real. I mean, it really started late 1800s. So like 1890s, but really started to accelerate. Um, and, you know, I, I would even say post-war, so so nineteen for late nineteen forties, nineteen fifties, it just saw this new kind of explosion. Um, and a part of that was all of a sudden people had cars too. Ah, yeah. So you didn't have to wait for a schedule. You weren't on a train getting off the same time hitting the river as, as everyone else. That really kind of took things in a different spin, but. You know, it, it started burgeoning in the uh, late 1800s. And, and, you know, you had areas, especially along the Beaverkill Valley, where, you know, you've got folks like, you know, Theodore Gordon, who a lot of people revere him as kind of, you know, one of the, you know, fathers of, you know, Catskill fly fishing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and as I mentioned earlier, Cats the Catskills are the birthplace of American fly fishing. Yeah. It really, it's, it, it's, you know, even though fly fishing happened in other places and even though the, you know, the, the Native Americans had their own version of it, you know, it was folks like Theodore Gordon who really kind of like met those, that, that the throngs of, of people coming up here and, you know, and said, Hey, let me, let me show you yeah. what's going on. Let me show you how to do this. Let me show you how to, this is why you're picking this pattern. You know, this is what's hatching right now. Um, what's cool about that is it did, you know, you see as the generations progressed, more of that knowledge steered them in, into the direction of conservation and ecology. Um, just because they're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, stream temperatures are going up. Wait a minute, bugs aren't hatching. Yeah. They're not here. Uh, and uh, the fish are dying. Um, so, you know, out of a love for their hobby and just the knowledge of trying to understand it. And it really is. It's an in-depth hobby. If you want to be any good at it. You got to know how to identify your bugs. Yep. How to you know figure out what's going on with their life cycle. Measure measure that you know know what's going on by the stream temperatures, um, and how the weather patterns affect you know future fishing. Yeah, it's um, compli it's so complicated. It's you know, I've you know I've met with a bunch of uh, guides, some fly fishing guides. I've I've had them on here, and you know my friend uh, Mark Sudek. I just was just hiking with him, and he's telling me all this stuff about fishing and fly fishing and stuff. And it has been going one, I'm not saying it's going one ear and out the other, but holy crap, yeah. it's a lot of stuff to retain. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
every time I speak with a fly fishing guide, I know that, okay, now there's another chapter of stuff I got to dig deeper into. Yeah. And that's, that's, you know, I, I, it, it's cool. You know, I always joke with my fly fishing, you know, guide friends. I'm like, you guys always say the hardest part is good technique. I'm like, the hardest part is all the stuff you learn. Yeah. So you know what the heck to do. I said, you, you can cast that, you know, that line like a pro, but if you don't know where to put it, what to put on it and what to look for, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're not pulling anything out. Yeah, you're not going to be successful. Yeah you're, looking, yeah. you're just looking pretty. It's like, okay, you go out in the Asopus and do a TikTok. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> That's what it is like now. Good Lord. Yeah. yeah. It's just, it's, it's really a lot of, it's remarkable. Like I never knew about, like, I've never, I've barely ever fished in my life, probably one time. And that was in the Susquehanna, the dirty waters of the Susquehanna. And they're probably weird fish and stuff like that up in there. But listening to the guides and talking about fly fishing and their passion for fly fishing, how awesome it is. And like you said, the water temperatures, how dark it has to be because it lowers the temperature. Um, yeah. the different types of insects that the, the trout and eat and stuff like that. It's just like, holy crap, this is, this is fishing. I thought you just put the, 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 the lure in the water and then you're done. You just have to wait for something to bite, but nope, nowhere near like that. Nope. No, it's, yeah, there's, there's some real science to it. It's pretty cool. Yeah. It's pretty cool. And it's, you know, fishing in particular. So from the headwaters of the beaver kill and the willowy muck. And then following it downstream has really shaped that region still to this day. You you go downstream, you get into Roscoe, and Roscoe is known as Trout Town, USA. Yep. Um, it's it's one of the easier, more accessible areas downstream uh, of the headwaters and of, of the two valleys. But it's because it's so accessible, it's a place that everyone gra- gravitates toward to this day for fly fishing. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it, it, fishing really was the easiest in a thing to to leave its mark on here hiking did you know leave a mark but where hiking really left a mark was in areas where there was a grand view so yeah. you, know, you think your slide mountains you think your catterskill high peaks the escarpment out east the the area where you can get that ooh ah you know catterskill high peak uh at, at one point had a uh had a, had a little tower on it and back then you know they charge you you know a nickel to go up and see the view yep uh, and, you know, it, it, that wasn't cheap. That was like, oh man, I'm gonna pay the uh, I'm gonna pay the forty five dollars to get the hop on hop off tour of New York City, or am I just gonna, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. So, oh geez, you know, crazy. Yeah. So, yeah. so that as, as we're gravitating towards the the 1950s and the 1940s, 1950s, fly fishing starts to take over. Fishing, being outdoors, is the recreational thing. Is the thing to do is to get outdoors to do that stuff. What happened yeah. after that? I know we had the bloom of the the borscht belt. Did the borscht belt have anything to do with this area? So the borscht belt is south of this area. That's what I thought. Um, south of this but, is south uh, southeast, correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you would pass through there on your way to. Um, so really, what what happened is you started to see a divide, and that, this area kind of started to you know. Get, get set aside again. It was where your bear hunters would go. It would be where your small game hunters would go for grouse and woodcock. It would be where your fly fishermen would go. Uh, and tourism started to take on different kind of angle where it was more families coming up. You know, you had Eastern European, uh, you know, Jewish families coming up. And for them, it was, you know, especially post-war, it was like, ah, let's, 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 you know, take a moment to appreciate the fact that we're over here. We're, we're together. We're fortunate enough to have a little extra money to scrape together, get out of the get out of the city, and you know have a little time to to recreate and relax. So it was centered more more along family activity then. So it wasn't just dad going off and going fly fishing. It was you know mom and dad doing stuff and stuff for the kids. So it became this more kind of family centric, um, and eventually developed into you know uh, t- towards the end of it towards these big resorts. Yeah. Where you know went from smaller communities to 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 these bigger resorts, uh, but that was further south, and you know that was that was kind of one subsect, and that was one portion of history. You know, interestingly, you know, just just kind of northeast of of, of these uh, these areas, these two valleys, you know, over the mountains and the, and the top end of the uh, Big Indian Wilderness, uh, you've got Fleischmann's before you get into Margaretville, and that used to be Griffin's Corners, mm-hmm. um, but. 
as the railroad came in and as, as you know, tourism was booming here and people had this, this extra money, all these immigrants had this extra money, the Fleischmann's family were starting to become you know, fairly notable and had been invited to certain events and then been excluded from certain events. And they kind of looked to an area to carve out uh, you know, their own little you know, slice of heaven where they would have their own mountain estates and stuff like that. And that's kind of where, where that area came. They, you know, it was an area where you had a lot of you know, Scotch, uh, Scotch Irish and, and German dairy farmers. Uh, you know, everyone thinks that the farms went bust out in the Catskills because the land was poor and people were from Europe and they didn't farm the same way. Mm. No, they, they, they weren't growing crops in rows. They, they were mostly, you know, dairy farmers or, or raising grazing animals like sheep or stuff like that for wool and meat. Crazy. So, you know, they'd have small, small gardens and stuff like that, but you know, uh, it, totally viable farm. So, you know, when these folks came in and said, Hey, we want to set up and, and, you know, do this, they're like, great. You know, we're, we're, we're busy on the farm. Yeah. How about it? Wow. And, uh, you know, it was cool as they kind of, they left a big mark. They brought you know baseball, uh, to that area. So they built the town park. They, they also had the, uh, you know, the baseball bat factory, uh, the baseball yeah. factory, uh, with, yeah, out there. Uh, they brought opera and art to the area, and then they uh, funded the town ba- town marching band. Wow! So, yeah, you know, which, which you know, now you know, now you're starting to see a little bit of, of revival coming back out there. But you can see how the how the railroad really like funneled, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of business in there. Uh, one statistic that that boggled my mind from the high point from the county line crossing from Ulster into Delaware County down into Margaretville. In the heyday of the railroad, there was 450 different lodging establishments just in that stretch from, from the peak down to the center of Margaretville town. Wow. So you think about how, how short that is. That's, that's what, like a 15-minute drive in the car today? Yep. Now, 450, you know, some of them were just little rooming houses. Some of them were, were bigger mountain houses. Some of them were these grand cottages that families would own, like the Fleischmanns. So there was massive, you know... You know, at one point, this this was really de- developed, and it was a you know a vacation area. It's the vacation valley, right in the beginning area. Yeah, 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 it, yeah, yeah. I had a guy on so, here talking you know, about that too. That's that's crazy. Yeah, that's the high point of between yeah. sa- slide and and fur or something, right? Yeah, yep, it was the high point, and then it went all the way down into the Big Indian on twenty three A, twenty three. Crazy, yeah, and then four hundred and fifty. 450 jesus yeah. wow so just imagine yeah. if you're you're driving up from big indian to slide to hike 450 hotels right were, were there yeah wow yeah you know hotels well, some were hotels some were some were little boarding houses but if we had 450 different choices if you wanted to pick a place to stay wow that's you know you, you look at it today and you're like oh, okay i've got you know slide mountain in uh, cold spring lodge the uh you know, yeah, that's there's it. There's a handful of places. <laughs> wow, <laughs> there's a handful of places. So you know, but yeah, so crazy. So what the the area, the Beaverkill and the Willowemock, were basically for for recreation stuff. Like I mean, there wasn't that many hotels and motels and stuff, but it was it was even even with recreation. Um, really, it was the Beaverkill itself that saw the most as far as fly fishing. Um, it's a little bit more accessible than the Willowy Mock. Um, it because it had the road going all the way alongside it, whereas the Willowy Mock kind of cuts in and out mm-hmm. um, and doesn't get big and juicy really till it gets further downstream. So whereas the, the, there's some great fishing all the way up deep into the headwaters uh, of the Beaver Kill. So it's it's just a little bit more robust and it was a little bit more accessible. Mm-hmm. Uh, along the Willowy Mock Valley, though, you get into that side of things. And it's just so rich with game to, to the point where I've gone hiking up in there multiple occasions uh, and really started to get to know the hunters because I run into them over and over again. And they're like, hey, you, hey, you. <laughs> hey, how are you doing? And I start to get to learn and, and hear these, these people's stories. And, you know, they'll talk about going out as a little kid with their grandparents, you know, the grandfather and, and, and uncles and, you know, their father, you know, multiple generations going out there, you know, grouse hunting or, or hunt, hunting for small, you know, bird game like that or hunting for rabbits uh, or, 
you know, setting trap lines and, and you know, getting beavers and, and you know, mink and, and fisher and stuff like that, getting fur bears. Wow. So that's that was more of a, you know, rough and tumble. And really, the area, I mean, Black Bear Road, uh, it turns into Wild Meadow Road at the end, but Black Bear Road, most of those, I, I think there's one or two that, that are used throughout the season. The rest of them are seasonal hunting camps. Oh, wow. And predominantly black bear hunting there's not a lot of i mean people do go up there to, to hunt deer but predominantly black bear hunting and it's you've got a very abundant population of bear up there so it's 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 quite interesting you know that how the two two sides of the valley because of accessibility and and because of you know just just what was, what was there you know you've got greater access to more water on the beaver kill side and on the Willow Emox side, that remoteness really just made it perfect for hunting. You can get in, get into some of the steeper terrain, some of the more sheltered areas and find that game, you know, or get up into the uplands and, and find that, that small game. So Crazy. It, it, it still remained, even though you had tourism, like just ringing it, you know, both north and south. You, you had all these lodging establishments. You had, you know, towns starting to develop, you know, the Borscht Park felt starting to, 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 you know, burgeon down there. It just always remained this remote place. Um, you know, uh, some of that was through the way the land was protected. Some of that was just, just, it was so in an, uh, inaccessible and really, you know, nature kind of, and I always say about that area, nature kind of like put its foot down and was like, nah, you know, yeah, you're not right. going to do that here. I'll let you get close, but I'm not letting you get into the heart of it. I'm not letting you get all the way in here. Nice. And when you really look at it, you know, you, you go from the south up to up Never Sink Hardenburg Trail, and you get into where you're, you're back in the wilderness, and then you just you turn upstream and follow that into that basin up there. And it's so remote. And you get to, to stretches where there's – it was so inaccessible that, that the tan barkers never got there, that, you know, the farmers who cut – timber down to to put fields never gotten there so you've got some patches of old growth wow and it's beautiful you're you, you know you're hiking along hiking along all of a sudden you turn to one side and you're like damn that's a big tree yeah yeah <laughs> you're like, wow that's pretty cool crazy um yeah awesome it's it's pretty wild yeah and that's yeah. why that's why i had you here tonight is just how, how wild and and full of history and rich that area is so i'm I'm excited to, to, I'm glad to have you here. I'm glad we, we, we hooked this up because it was wicked. Yeah. And it's, it's, you know, it's a cool area. And it, it, you, you made the point earlier of a, a lot of people don't normally gravitate towards it because there's not high peaks there. You know, the high peaks are just to the North or just to the East. Of mm -hmm. it. And it was really one of those things where I was just kind of looking on a map one day. I'm like, huh. Let's see if I could, you know, test my math and compass skills and bushwhack to this this pond. Now, if you look at a newer map, the pond's not there because the pond's not there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. But on the older map, there did used to be a pond that was there at the at the head of the Willowima. Mm -hmm. And what happened is a hurricane came through and blew out the beaver dam, and the pond's no longer there. But yeah, you know, so bushwhacked, and I discovered this, you know, essentially now new beaver meadow, and I was like, well, that's weird. I know I didn't get it wrong. Yeah, right. <laughs> but this doesn't look like it does on the map. You know, and then I started, I, I did the beaver kill range from there and then looped back around and ran into some hunters, started chatting with them. And, you know, and it was kind of neat because they were kind of like, what are you here for? <laughs> I was kind of like, what are you here for? I mean, I know, I know opening day hunting season's tomorrow, but what are you doing here today? Right. You know, kind of like we quizzed each other on knowledge and they were like, oh, cool. Hey, did you see anything? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, one last question. Uh, where yeah. is your favorite place in the Catskills? Ooh. Ooh, right. I mean, besides the Willowemeck and Beaverco Valley, but. So there's going to be a very tiny portion in there, and it's it's not going to be a hike. It's going to be a canoe trip. Uh, and actually, Mike Kudish told me about this, and he mentioned it and, and, and said he didn't like the place as much because the experience he had wasn't that great, yeah. but I, I'm thinking to myself, well, he went like end of May, early June, the water's too low. So I went early spring one year, and this is the Furbrook. So you come along Pole Road there, oh. like you're coming up, you know, uh, Black Bear Road, and then there's a turn, Pole Road, goes around uh, Round Pond. 
And all of a sudden, there's a little sign for state land. You pull off right there, hike maybe 50 feet into the woods, drop your canoe in the water. Now, it's not an easy paddle even when the water's hot because there's a lot of beaver impoundments and some deadfall, you know, some, some blow down across. So you're working to get downstream there. Mm -hmm. But it's you're in an area, as Dr. Kudish would say, it reminds him more of the Adirondacks because of the composition of the forest. There's more spruce in there. Mm -hmm. Um, so it looks and it feels and just the way the water and the, and the, the beaver habitat is kind of set up, it looks and feels more like the Adirondacks than it does the Catskills. Um, so it's a real, you know, it's, it's a short paddle. You, you could do it in a day. I like to get about halfway back and then just kind of bushwhack into the woods camp for the night nice. and then make it out the next morning. But it's a paddle you're working for. It's not a leisurely paddle. Like you get to stuff and you're like, all right, can I, can I, push my can i gain a little speed and push my way over this yeah can I, do I have to get out and drag this so you know yeah so it's it's one of those ones you're working for but you know you're probably the only one back there uh, maybe one or two people uh you know but they're going back to to hunt yeah they're not going back and paddling they're, you know you could see where where the little encroachment comes for say duck hunters i saw one guy out there duck hunting once uh, you know wow saw another guy out there and uh, during deer hunting season he was just going like oh, i'll go near the water source they got to come get water sometime you know and they they were startled to see me in a canoe yeah yeah right <laughs> what the hell is this psycho but, doing here <laughs> yeah they're like who, who are you what are you doing here <laughs> nice crazy yeah. it's in interesting uh, i'll have to check that out sometime yeah, it's it's a good one. I definitely definitely recommend a canoe over a kayak. Definitely Royal X if you can. Something a little bend and give so you can squeeze your way over obstacles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the aluminum ones tend to hang up. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's it's worth getting back there, and uh, it's worth exploring. And uh, it's just it's a whole new world back there. And even though you're, you're paralleling the road most of the time, it's a road that's so rarely used outside of hunting season. You're not going to hear a car, and when you do, you're like, "Oh, wow! I forgot about yeah, that." Yeah, right. <laughs> awesome. Which is kind of cool. Yeah, definitely. So um, yeah. that kind of that we're, we're, that kind of concludes the uh, the day, man. Um, one last thing. Uh, post. I have uh, Mary Teacher out. One of my friends on Facebook suggested this uh, to get you know local businesses out. Um, it's called Post Hike. Oh, absolutely. Brews and bites. Where do you suggest name a name one place that's your favorite place to go out in the Catskills to get something to eat or drink? Ooh, uh, that's a tricky one. So, right. I would definitely say Union Grove Distillery for for a drink. Hell yeah! Out in uh, yeah, out in Arkville there. Uh, those guys are great. Todd and Brian are great. Uh, I got good stuff. I gotta get and, them on uh, here. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're great people. Good product, uh, and you know they know the area. Yeah, you know, locals. Good folks to get a bite. Well, that's a tricky one. There's a lot of great places. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, one of my favorites is actually a pre a pre hike bite. Okay. So coming out 28, coming from Kingston, because that's where I'm coming from. I stop at this little place. It's a little to go place. It's got four little windows you drive up to. It's called Mara's on the Go. And they've got all sorts of stuff there. And one day I was kind of like, wait a minute. You, you got steak and they're like, yeah. And I'm like, you got bacon and eggs. You got hash browns? They're like, yeah. And I'm like, all right, give me a wrap, bacon, steak, egg, and cheese with a hash brown in it, crispy with some hot sauce and ketchup. <laughs> and they're like, well, what kind of wrap? Whole wheat, white, or spinach? And I was like, put it in the spinach one. We got to do something healthy. Nice. And so I kept on ordering that. And they're like, you got to give us a name for this one. So if you ever go there, uh, ask, ask them for the woodsman. The woodsman. Okay. Yeah. Um, what's How do you say that place again? uh mara m-a-r-a mara oh mara Mara's on the okay go. okay yeah okay excellent i will tag that in there so excellent the woodsman excellent all right yeah. well excellent thank you very much will for for joining me tonight and giving a that's been a blast it's yeah uh, I'm, I'm glad you reached out it's uh you know I, I every once in a while i catch you you know you'll post uh i'll see it on facebook and i'll you know kind of oh what was he talking about oh you know yeah I mean, it's it's you know because sometimes you're talking with someone that I haven't talked to, so it's you know you get, you get to hear something new, get to learn something. Hell yeah, and that's so. that's why I like doing this. I'm learning so much new stuff, and it's and it and it's and it's great to to hear about the history in the Catskills. It's so rich, full of history.
Yeah. So excellent. Well, thanks, Will, for joining me. I, I hope you have a fantastic night. And uh absolutely you as well. Let's get together sometime and 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 hike. Yeah, no, we're we're overdue for a hike. We had I know pre COVID we had planned to go uh yeah. do some bushwhacking out in uh Delaware County and then schedules just didn't line up and then of course COVID happened and everyone's like, All right, yeah, <laughs> you hike hike by yourself for a while. Yep, yep. <laughs> so yeah, let let's get something something together and we will do a crazy bushwhack out in the Beaver Kill Willowimaka area. Oh yeah. Have you ever done the Beaver Kill Range? I haven't. Oh no, no, I have not. That's a good one. Uh no matter which side you come in from, it's just a pretty cool experience. When because once you get up to the to the ridge, you're just kind of just bouncing along yeah, and all the little bumps. And 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 they're really easy. And because there's a lot of hunting activity back there, there's a pretty good ridge trail. So nice. You kind of get to like re- you kind of get to really relax and, and enjoy the scenery and this new perspective on the Catskills that you don't normally see. Exactly. And there's there years ago there was an old trailer in the woods. They were supposed to have removed it because the state bought the land, but I don't think they helicoptered it out yet. So <laughs> I think it might still be back there. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So it's good. Kind of one of those things I've been meaning to get back there to, to to check on it because it was one of those things where we used to just like go back there and hang out. Mm-hmm. You know, we knew it was abandoned. It was like, you know, let's forget bringing tents. We got a trailer. You know? Yeah, it's not great. It's horrible condition, but you know, it's it's a tent for the night. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, excellent. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's do that. So, um, have a good night, Will. I, I thank you for joining me. Absolutely, Sasha. It was great. All right, peace. Raise the glass. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you again. Cheers, brother. Cheers. Cheers. Hey guys, I just want to thank you for listening to the show. If you enjoyed the show, subscribe and throw down a smooth review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or any podcast platform that you use. You can also check daily updates of the podcast, hikes, hiking memes, and local news on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and the official website of the show. Remember this, you just keep on living, man. L-I-V-I-N.